Jesse James Hughes looked like something out of central casting for an old western movie. Wearing a black cowboy hat and having run-ins with the law, he took to the boxing ring and fought like a real-life Rocky Balboa. Throwing tattoos of a skull and an Old West six-shooter on his arm, Hughes would have the fitting nickname of James Hughes was born on October 20th, 1965, the firstborn son to Jerry and Winifred Hughes. He would grow up in the Dauphin Island Parkway area known as the Dip to those in Mobile, Alabama. His father was a firefighter in Mobile and gave James the responsibility of looking after his three younger brothers. In an interview with Doghouse Boxing, Jerry Hughes said, quote, He never let anybody touch one of his brothers. Back in those days, you had, and I hate to say this, the blacks coming into the schools and picking on all the white kids. James definitely kicked some of their asses in the schools for picking on his brothers, even though they were all bigger than him. Hughes was smaller than most of the kids and was described by his father as being a quiet loner. He would work out on his own in his bedroom, preparing for confrontations that would inevitably come because of his small stature. His father tried to instill a work ethic in him from an early age, having his sons help out in his many side hustles, which included landscaping and catching oysters. When James turned 12, his father began teaching him how to box. He put up a makeshift heavy bag in the loft of their barn and would teach his son everything he knew about self-defense. Realizing that his son was a natural, Jerry would take him to the amateur boxing program run by Cheffy Reyna. James would take to the sport immediately and would begin winning local tournaments. Not only did his father train him to be a boxer, but also a top-notch fisherman and hunter. But as Hughes came of age, he would apply his hunting skills to the streets of Mobile. He would don himself in camouflage and lie in wait in an area of town known as the Bottoms. He wasn't hunting for deer, but for drug dealers. He would stake out the residences of known traffickers, and once they left their home, he would break in, stealing their drugs and money. In and out of trouble since becoming a teenager, Hughes would eventually serve nine months at a Montgomery, Alabama detention center. While his father was a firefighter for over 30 years, and his three brothers were on the straight and narrow, James chose a more chaotic path for his life. He tried odd jobs and found employment as a roofer, but he didn't stick with it. In July of 1987, Hughes would turn to professional boxing. He would win more than he would lose, but he still had the look of a journeyman about him. He would be brought in as an opponent for future champions like Maurice Blocker and Vincent Petway. Hughes only saw boxing as a way to make quick money, and the criminal life still beckoned. Hughes and a friend would hang out in bars where drug dealers were known to do business. They would target a dealer, wait until all his pockets were full of money, then wait for him to leave. Hughes and his friend would then accost the man, claiming to be undercover police officers. They would take his money, threaten to make an arrest, but then make up a story so they could let the guy go. There would be one occasion where Hughes would rob a man by knife point and take $442. He would then be sent to the Fountain Correctional Facility in Atmore, one of Alabama's deadliest prisons. Hughes's manager, Jerry Tillman, would lobby authorities on his behalf, and the fighter was allowed to resume his boxing training while in custody. Upon his release from prison, Hughes would get married and resume his boxing career. He would take on the likes of Buddy McGirt and Stefan Ouellette, losing but serving notice that he was an improving and dangerous fighter. His coming out party would be against Anthony Stevens as he would go into the favorite's hometown and take his USBA title. Hughes will get to him eventually. Hughes throwing good shots. 
That's not where Anthony Stevens wants to be in the corner, and he's getting hit with some pretty good shots. Good right hand by Hughes. Hughes was trying to escape the corner, and he walked right into it. Hughes does not have the legs to show you the movement he needs. Nice combination by Anthony Stevens. He backs Hughes up for the first time in a long time and gets him in the corner with a good right hand. For the first time, James Hughes looks like he's in danger. Yes, I knew I had to be the judge. I'm in his backyard. Uh, I've been consecutively in back people's backyards, and I've been robbed on a bunch of occasions. I got robbed at the world-famous Blue Horizon. Hey, it could happen anywhere. That showed me right there. Did your battle plan work to perfection? Yes, I kept a lot of pressure on him. I knew he would fade in the later rounds. Kept the pressure on, okay. I caught him. The bout would be voted the USBA's Fight of the Year. The win earned him another televised fight, this time against the undefeated Adrian Stone. Once again, Hughes would be the underdog and once again proved the doubters wrong. The back-to-back come-from-behind victories earned him a fan base who wanted to see more of the outlaw. Hughes was just a breath of fresh air, broadcaster Al Bernstein said. He was always nice to be around. He was a character without being demeaning. Even the guys he beat, Adrian Stone, he once told me, you know, I really like that guy. That's typical of the way people reacted to him. When Hughes stepped into the ring against Nick Rupa, he seemed like a completely different fighter than what he was only a year earlier. Brimming with confidence, he was now a legitimate contender for the welterweight title. A victory would put him in line to face Felix Trinidad for the IBF welterweight crown and a $300,000 payday. Champion, if you have not been with us lately, you may not know that James Hughes won the title from Anthony Stevens in a spectacular match, which he knocked Stevens down four times. Then defended it against Adrian Stone, who was literally beaten from pillar to post for eight and a half rounds, then came back to knock Adrian Stone out. Multiple men in boxing, Georgie Benton in his corner. Georgie Benton, the master of slipping punches on the inside and moving the head back and forth. And there is a good shot by Rupa. Big right to the head of James Hughes, the exchange right. That's the kind of stuff that only gets you fired up. Though. You don't want to make him too mad. Huh? Into trouble if he can. 
Now, if Hughes can get his jab going, he'll be a different fighter as well. Good hook on the inside by James Hughes. Remember, he stunned Rupert with the hook. I believe it was in round one. So he sure he, he has power. When you're in row 17 and you see guys firing shots from the side, it looks good. <laughs> Why the crowd gets into those type of fights when they're into this. Uh, Hughes needs to get that alarm clock going here and turn it up a little bit because Rupa has been technically good in this fight, keeping Hughes off him. Yeah, he really played to it very well, too. Good hook by James Hughes. Big hook by Rupa. Wow, that was a good one. That may have hurt Hughes. Is that possible? Can you hurt Hughes with a punch? I don't know. There goes Rupa from the left hook. He is wobbled. What a shot by Hughes. My gun versus your gun. They opened it up, and that's Hughes' fight now. Nick Rupa is hurt. That left came from nowhere from James Hughes after he was whacked. Rupa's locked his mouthpiece. Now it is a shootout, and James Hughes loves it. And you see him getting everything into a shot here. The crowd up on their feet. They were quiet a second ago. And Hughes trying to win it right now. Let me Well, now that you... And he's better and more dangerous after he gets hit. Big right by Hughes. Look how precise he is when he's got a guy hurt. It's almost the antithesis of the way he normally fights. Look at his distance. It's exactly right. He's turning. He's got balance. He can win it right now. He does. It's over. They throw the towel in and Nick Rupa goes down him down if you want to win a fight he retains his usba welterweight title right after he got hit twice didn't waste anything right as soon as i seen he was hurt i shortened all my punches in and i chopped them in real close and got all my body into the power now i want me a world title shot i'm hanging back for him they're scared though look at parnell whitaker gonna fight what camacho he should wear panties man fighting somebody camacho needs to be on social security and he's gonna fight Parnell Whitaker. I mean, that's a joke. Uh, getting back to you, has this been the most enjoyable year of your life, the way things have gone the last three fights particularly? So far, yeah, I've, I've stayed dedicated and focused on my career, and it's paying off well. I'm gonna get me a world title. Well, you're showcasing the belt. How soon do you think that can happen for you? Well, they're, uh, they're working on it now. Hopefully this year I should get a uh, world title shot. Hughes' life and career was at an all-time high. But only two months later, on July 24th, 1995, Hughes would drop by his wife's tanning salon to do some painting. He finished and left for the boxing gym, where he sparred for one round, but didn't feel up for any more, and left. According to Hughes' trainer, Wally Dinkins, he had witnessed James and his manager, Jerry Tillman, arguing outside the gym. Hughes stormed off and is said to have driven to his apartment. Things get sketchy about what happened next. Jerry Tillman stated in a local paper that he followed James as he thought he was going to meet with a drug dealer and go on one of his kicks. He watched James enter his apartment and come out wearing a fresh set of clothes before taking off again in his truck. Tillman then stated to have lost Hughes after a traffic signal held him up. According to Hughes's family, when James's dead body was found, he was still in the same clothes that he left the gym in. Newspaper reports state that Hughes visited at least two bars after leaving the gym. The next morning, the surveillance camera at an ATM recorded Hughes withdrawing $100. Three hours later, his truck would be found next to the railroad tracks. His sunglasses and black cowboy hat remained inside. Someone had removed a roofing hatchet from the truck, apparently to cut some tree limbs to free the truck from the tracks. James's brother Pat saw things otherwise. He said, quote, when James's truck was found on the railroad tracks, Jerry basically was trying to cover up that James might have been doing something wrong because he had an upcoming fight. They were just trying to clean up the mess. My brother is dead in the swamp, but they were trying to get it cleaned up and they ruined the whole crime scene. The sheriff comes in and they go through the truck and there's a hatchet lying there in his hat, but no sign of my brother. What do they do? They just pick it all up and pull my brother's truck off the tracks with a train engine. A storm would rage through the area, and 11 days after the authorities discovered his truck, Hughes's bloated body would be found floating in the nearby swamp. His father was called to identify the now decomposed remains and was able to positively ID James, 
because of his tattoos. James's keys, wallet, and watch were missing. The autopsy report showed he had cocaine in his system, but not enough to kill him. While the cause of death was listed as unknown, there were two unexplained injuries, a bruise on the side of his head and either a bruise or an abrasion in his throat area. Speculations and hearsay over what happened to Hughes would mount over the years. Some say his murder was payback from a drug dealer that Hughes did dirty. There were speculations that Jerry Tillman and Hughes had a money dispute. The sheriff overseeing the investigation was Jack Tillman, brother of Hughes's manager Jerry and a former boxer himself. The Hughes's family believed that the sheriff was too inexperienced to properly handle the case. Sheriff Tillman countered that he had over five detectives working the case. What happened to Jesse James Hughes on that day in July remains a mystery. So many different things go through your mind, James's widow Carmen said. You think of everything. The only sure thing is that nobody knows what happened. And that's the hardest thing about it. Not knowing.